Is this thing on? Because it's getting ready to be on. Hey everybody, welcome to Bell Ringer. My name is Greg. Your guest name today is Shatora Donovan. She is the Chief Diversity Officer for the City of Buffalo. The City of Buffalo is one of the first cities across America that started a diversity and inclusion office and hired a Chief Diversity Officer. Shatora has great thoughts on a ton of different issues across our region and this is one of my favorite episodes she's awesome spoke to my leadership buffalo class so i hope you guys enjoy that we brought her on the podcast thanks so much for listening so tell us in the audience a bit about your role in city hall and your background that kind of got you here uh so i am the chief diversity officer for the city of buffalo um Chief diversity officer roles in municipal governments usually can take two different avenues. One can be internal, where you really focus on human resource issues and um, uh, culture, internal culture and uh, living issues for your employees um, and, you know, making sure that you have a diverse and inclusive environment. And then the other uh, chief diversity officer role in municipal government is outward facing Um, economic inclusion, helping businesses grow in the community, um, looking at policies and making sure that the policies themselves are inclusive um, and different ways of engaging with the community. Uh, My role for the city of Buffalo is more of the external role. So I engage a lot with the community, um, really focusing on economic inclusion, working with small businesses, women, minority-owned businesses. Um, We help, uh, we make sure that whoever is doing business with the city of Buffalo is doing it inclusively. So whether or not the business owner themselves um, are reflective of uh, diversity, right? So minorities and women, or if um, the, the contractor, the business owner does business with those small businesses. Uh, we also do uh, lots of community benefit agreements. So um, those are extra ways that we can help the community whenever the city actually sells land. Um, we look at the, the area around where we're selling that land and we try to uh, write in ways into the contract, like how the developer can be more inclusive for whatever their proposed project is in the future. Um, And compliance issues. So anytime anyone does business with the city, uh, generally they have to have 25% of that contract has to go to a minority business owner and 5% of that contract has to go to a woman business owner. So we don't just enforce compliance, but we really make sure that compliance is something that is bringing our communities together Um, So we make sure that we get the primes, uh, the prime contractors and their subcontractors all in the room together to talk about how they're going to fill those goals and um, help them along the way be successful. Um, So really changing the conversation around diversity community wide. It's more than just checking a box. It's actually um, being inclusive so that as we move forward, everyone has more opportunity um and and we keep everyone in buffalo happy and healthy and vibrant right and you were uh, correct me if i'm wrong you were a lawyer yeah. and you worked at the science museum was it yeah. beforehand yeah so yeah. what about um you know what about this community has made you want to serve it as long as you have now with city hall but the museum like cultural establishment and you know, even in your in your law career, I'm sure. Yeah. So uh, when I practiced, actually, I I was an immigration attorney, and immigration in and of itself, immigration law spans uh, many different kinds of law. So family law, corporate law, um, criminal law, all of those different um, areas actually factor into immigration. Uh, and so I had the privilege to do a little bit of everything in my practice when I did immigration law, but um, there's also a humanitarian side 
to immigration law specifically when you're talking about refugees and asylees, people who face persecution um, in in their home countries, and um, and so that practice helped really deepen my understanding of just like the human condition and how we're all really trying to have like one basic right and and that's our liberty that's our freedom to like live and be happy and prosper <laughs> like right. it's really simple um and it was also the most heartbreaking work i've ever done as well um because you can't save everybody even if even if you work really hard and you try really hard to um so that you know practicing immigration really gave me an interesting view of different countries different cultures how how different areas of the world interact with the rest of the world um and that kind of played into i because i have a, a master's in social work and it really played well into my social work background as well and then um i decided to pursue a career more like in nonprofit management and getting deeper into the community, which led me to work at the Buffalo Museum of Science. I really wanted to work at the Buffalo Museum of Science because I'm from Buffalo and the Museum of Science is on Buffalo's east side, right in the heart of Martin Luther King Jr. Park. And if you actually like stand in the middle of the park and you look around, it is a gorgeous neighborhood. Yeah. And unfortunately, over time, like the narrative has become that it's a place that you stay away from. So I was really excited to get the opportunity to work at the Museum of Science and help change that narrative. Um, uh, one of my favorite things that I was able to in, uh, institute when I was there is the neighbor pass. And I believe they still have the neighbor pass. So it's an annual membership for anybody who lives in and around uh, the museum. And they can go there for $10 for the whole year, their whole family, right? right? And it's just a way of, again, like bringing the community in and really showing them like you matter, you're important, and we value you so much that we want we, we want to make it as easy as possible for you to engage with us. Um, and, you know, that's still how uh, the leadership at the museum wants to interact and how they do interact with the community. So knowing that in Buffalo, unfortunately, a lot of times we, um, you know, we get caught up in our own neighborhoods and, and what we're used to and venturing outside of that can be a little um, unknown, uncertain, right? So the the museum already attracted people from outside of the neighborhood. So now when you have people there who are from the neighborhood, it just shows you like, Oh, this is this is new. This is something that is is gonna make my experience richer because I get to interface with people from all over the region and not just the same old, you know. Right. And yeah. It's, it's those conscious and thoughtful decisions that make such an impact. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, before we kind of dive into a lot of your role, um, I want to zoom out a little bit and just talk about the significance of even having a chief diversity officer. Yeah. Um, I think you told me we were one of the first couple cities in the country to have one. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, what does it mean to even have that position, uh, you know, in our, in our area and how important is it to everybody that lives here? So the, the role of the diversity, the discipline of diversity, equity, and inclusion is, it's like an emerging, uh, it's, it's an emerging field, but it's kind of always been here at the same time, right? It's just that we're we're finding new and better ways to um, get the message across, right? Uh, having a, a chief diversity officer in office of diversity, opportunity, and inclusion, having a mayor who champions the opportunity agenda. Right. It really shows that government can actually be a catalyst for change. Um, and even though government is big and because you are transparent in government, you oftentimes work a little slower because you have to be really smart about what you do. It, it shows that when you have the, the will, the leadership 
um, you can really make things happen. And so it's more than just the title uh, and the office that matters. It's also how the position was shaped. Uh, you can really tell that, because I'm not the first chief diversity officer in the city of Buffalo. So my predecessor, Crystal Rodriguez, was also instrumental in working with the mayor to form this role to actually like look out towards the community. Because it really shows how important being responsive to you know the residents of the city of buffalo is and making sure as we've seen a lot of economic uh development economic spark happen we do not want to leave anybody behind so you have to be intentional like you said you have to be intentional deliberate about it and um and i think that's what's so incredible about this and then you know folding that in with what the business community in the area is doing and what what the mayor did with diversity and how that sparked something for the business community to take diversity to the next level within their organizations. I think that means for Buffalo, give it time. We're really going to outpace the rest of the nation um, in, uh, in like high functioning organizations. Yeah. And we're gonna really be attracting a lot of great talent to the region um it's gonna happen soon because of this right yeah that's a lot of what our organization is focused on right now and promoting that in a lot of our marketing materials and this podcast is you know a way to do that but it's it's attractive to people outside of the region yeah it is so we were talking about our mutual friend Royce uh, before. <laughs> no, <I'm> kidding. <laughs> <laughs> He's, this is the third. I think this is the third straight podcast that I've mentioned Royce's name. So Royce will be happy. Is uh, he running twenty twenty four? Yeah. <laughs> um, so we were talking about him off mic. Um, he was on the podcast. We talked about minority and women entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. What he's doing at the Beverly Beverly Gray Business Exchange Center. I it's mumble a lot. that every it's a lot. time. We call it the exchange. Just the exchange. So you can that call it the so exchange. Yeah. That is yeah. what I want to yeah. do. <laughs> every single time I mumble it. Even when I type it, I mess it up. It's a lot. I do too. All right. So the exchange. <laughs> he talked about the importance of the work that they're doing. Yeah. Um, you know, what's your take on that? How, how can minority and women entrepreneurship help, you know, our economy, our economy's comeback, which we're already in the midst of, but how can it help further it? Oh, wow. So first is the fact that you are going to have um, people solving problems that traditional business owners didn't even know existed, right? So that's the first thing I think. I always think of the hair care industry because like when I grew up, you chemically straightened your hair if you were a black woman. And now you guys can't see me, but Greg can. And like, <laughs> you know, people are like, oh, you're the girl with the curly hair. And that's because finally people stepped up and said, we have to make hair products that work for this kind of hair, right? Not everybody has straight hair that can, you know, can just dry itself and be all perfect all the time. I need help. <laughs> like, I need help. So, so that's my example because that's personal yeah. to me. But I think, first of all, you're going to have diverse business owners solving diverse problems, right? Um, and I meet a lot of the entrepreneurs in this city and they are really, really smart and doing things that we need. It, like, you know, I was even talking to somebody yesterday and it was like, what we're talking about today is what um, cybersecurity was like 15 years ago. And now everybody knows they need cybersecurity. So like, you know, being on the cutting edge, you need that diversity and perspective and thought. But above and beyond that, you're going to change the trajectory of people's lives. You're you're going to, by being inclusive uh, with these small businesses, you're actually going to um, build wealth in communities and change how they are able to pass down resources to their children um, and their children's children. Right. So, I, you know, I think that there is no one loses, honestly, in any of this because they're going to create jobs. Um, and normally, you know, you're going to hire people who are in your circle, right? So you're you're gonna pull in people and maybe give them chances that they wouldn't have had historically. Um, you're gonna solve new problems and you're gonna build more wealth 
in your community. Right. Yeah. And provide more services to those that live in it. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, because there's neighborhoods around uh, the city where there's not enough resources. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. We talked to um, uh, Ben Bissell from Weedy, same kind of thing. You know, t- He talked a lot about refugees that have settled on the west side of Buffalo, but one of his greatest success stories that he mentioned was somebody that opened a like a bottle return center mm-hmm. that wasn't there previously and you know that's a storefront in the area that community members can go to and leverage after yeah, yeah. It, it, speaking of weedy it makes me think of grant street right like i you know growing up grant grant street is so different now and it's so vibrant and awesome it's one of my favorite places to go so right. and that's because of places like Weedy and, you know, their deliberate, intentional policies. Right. Yeah. And the exchange. And the exchange. <laughs> Not the Beverly Gray Business Exchange. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so, you know, we're talking about that we're at this kind of inflection point. Um, what cybersecurity was 15 years ago, this is that moment where we're on the cutting edge. Um, you spoke to our leadership, Buffalo Group, um, on a panel about diversity and you made a great point about even though this is for the next 5, 10, 15 years, there's such a key role that the older generation plays in this. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of restate that for the audience. <laughs> Do you want me to just state the whole thing I was saying? Or? Maybe not the whole okay. thing. You know, we, need it, okay. we need it on mic. Whatever you feel today. <laughs> so I think, I think that we have to be really, really smart about how we talk about this work. Because when you talk about diversity, when you talk about equity, you're talking about very specific things. And they're not binary. It's not black versus white. It's not rich versus poor, right? These are very complex, uh, deep-seated issues. And so in order to solve problems like that, (laughs) and maybe solve is even too aspirational of a word, but to move forward uh, against the grain, right? You need everybody to help. And I know that the human condition is such, there are more good people in the world than there are bad, right? Just, and so my baseline is that everybody wants to help. However, it's my job as somebody who works in this field and who studies these things to convince you, you know, to kind of sell you on why, if maybe you're not reflective of, who, I, who you think I'm trying to help, I have to show you like, no, I'm really actually helping you too. This isn't just for black people. This isn't just for Hispanics. This isn't just for refugees or working class people. You know, um, equity, yes, it means giving is, you know, the picture with the box and you've got the three people trying to look over the fence. And if everybody, if everybody's different heights and they have the same size box, well, the shortest person still can't see over the fence, right? So equity is really proportional. So yeah, sometimes there that's why we talk about like those deliberate policies and practices but um i think that everyone benefits from inclusion for several reasons um the 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 baseline reason that i always give is economically right so you need qualified workers you need uh, more services in your area you need a happier work environment work culture well Here's the data that shows that when you have a more inclusive work environment, you have happier staff, you have higher returns. You, you know, all those things right. work with that. Um, but the, the other thing too is that uh, this work, talking about equity and inclusion, is not about exclusion. It's not like, okay, well, you're not a woman or you're not Hispanic, so you can't be a part of this conversation. No, 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 no. Actually, the fact that, and I'll be specific, like if you're, because I think the one demographic that feels completely out of the loop of all these conversations are white men, right? Right. And it's like, okay, well, I need, and I'll just talk about myself, the, a lot of the opportunities that I've gotten, even in my life, are because of white men. Like, you know, so I have no, my, my former partner, my former law partner and my former boss is a white man, but showed me so much grace, was so gracious, showed me so much kindness um, and extended opportunities to me 
that no one else would have. And it had nothing to do with him being white or me being black. It was because he had an opportunity and he, and he saw potential in me, right? Like, mm -hmm. to me, it's really that simple. I don't think, I, I really um, don't like putting people in boxes because we're all so complex and, and different that like by reducing people to what you see on the outside really um, devalues everything else they can bring to the table. So yes, there is a thing called privilege and men benefit from it and white men benefit more from it than other men. But we all have levels of privilege that we should be aware of. And I think that making sure that everyone knows that even though you know, we are at this inflection point where we're talking about diversity and inclusion and equity and all the buzzwords. There is a seat for everyone at the table and no one should be pushed out. How do you balance all the new development that's going on? You know, we're in economic development, so that's a lot of our focus. How do you balance all this new in the city while making sure that every person remains a part of our renaissance? Ooh. Oh, that's a hard question. And it was something you mentioned in your, I think your first answer. Um, that that's a goal that you have. You know? Yeah, I think um, the I think that education, um, communication, is really like the secret sauce to life. A lot of times, people get upset or frustrated because they don't know what's going on, and if you are able to communicate effectively for your audience, um, that's really gonna be a game changer. So one way to make sure that everybody is included is to talk to them on their terms. You know, I, one of my criticisms is when people use too much uh, buzzwords, too, too much lingo, like keep it simple if you really want a message to get across. Um, so, so I think if, if we can really figure out how to communicate all of the wonderful things going on around the region and speak directly to those communities, however they need to be communicated with, um, which is not easy. You're in communication. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it is not easy. But I think that that's, that will um, encourage a lot of people uh, to continue to try to be involved and and to have their voices heard. Uh, one thing, one thing that I've often seen um, when somebody uh, approaches you and they might be like a little defensive or upset, is because they've tried to talk to people before and they're just expecting to get shut down. And so the minute I step back, and I and I let them know, like, no, I want to hear what you have to say, and I'm going to follow up with you. That changes their whole demeanor and and their and their whole perspective. So many communities haven't been spoken to at all. Um, right. So yeah. Um, so I wanted to end on a optimistic note. What makes you optimistic for the future of Buffalo? A lot. Um, the easy answer is that because I get to sit with people who are leading the city on every level, business, um, cultural, nonprofit, and government, I see how much everybody cares about the future of Buffalo. And um, so, you know, see, like I see the sausage and it's pretty clean, believe it or not. Like yeah. I have not really come across anybody who doesn't want to make it better. Um, I'm also optimistic because I think just the world is changing um, and the people that we are growing in Buffalo, you know, homegrown folks like like you and I, I think that we are we are really uh, looking forward to working with each other um, and seeing each other prosper. I think the people in Buffalo, um, act, you know, climate change might help us too because <laughs> because people might want to be somewhere where the weather is a little was, yeah. a little bit more i don't know if there our was that harvard study yeah with the, the great lakes water level or something like 
we're like the fourth safest city for right. climate change. Right, right, like yeah. So we're a climate refuge, yeah. as the mayor said in his state of the city. We're the fourth safest city from natural disasters. Right, no right. Earthquakes, hurricanes, all that. Right. I think, yeah, I think where we're situated is is great. Um, I mean, there there's so much. I think the only thing that we really need to do is keep working hard. Like, it's not going to change in overnight like there is no finite amount of time um i really look at the work i do as n not for us but for the next generation i'm hoping maybe one day i can tell my kids i had this job and they're like oh my god that existed mm -hmm. you know we don't we're so glad we don't need that anymore and you're you're young and you're already thinking about <laughs> the next generation which is a good mindset to have yeah that's what that's what you need in, in when we're at such an early point in this kind of burgeoning it's weird to call it a field, but yeah, for lack of a better term. It is, yeah. Do you want an opportunity to plug your podcast? I listened, you and Jamil, <laughs> very good. Here's your chance. Here's your moment. This is my moment to plug, to plug. Here we go. Okay, so I, I have a podcast that I co-host with Jamil Cruz. Um, that podcast has nothing to do with my role as... <laughs> As Chief Diversity Officer for the City of Buffalo, but uh, it's a passion project of mine uh, that I do uh, on the side because I noticed that um, there were a lot of issues that we that are faced in the workplace, and I wanted to elevate the conversation about those issues. Um, so it's called the B Suite. What black people talk about at work <laughs> is the tagline. That's the tagline. But the but the podcast is just the B suite, and it's really about um, you know everyday issues that we face. Maybe they're in the workplace, or maybe they're just issues that you might talk about in the workplace. Um, and it's told through young black professional perspective, really. Um, and so we have a great time i don't know if you had the chance to to listen to I it did, did yeah, you yeah. what'd you think about it I'm, on my walk back from my last meeting yeah because i knew we were about to record i was like i gotta i gotta listen to a little bit more so i thought it was awesome um i bet the aisha curry uh -huh. part of that episode yeah. with um so there's some pop culture too for people uh listening that are thinking about listening to to that podcast, which is a kind of a cool tie-in as well. Yeah, I think pop culture is really important to, I, I mean, the black experience and just any experience, really. Pop culture kind of shapes what's happening around you. Um, so, and then we, you know, we get deeper into some issues, but we try to keep it um, light and upbeat, but also productive for like, yeah. how you can how how you can be more successful and how you navigate through work right yeah awesome well thank you so much for your time you've been super gracious to end we always do a blizzard round <laughs> a couple fast questions All you, right. you might have cheated if you listen to Royce's but we'll see <laughs> if you were a flavor of ice cream what would you be uh salted caramel book or tv show that you'd recommend um big little lies on hbo I want to start that. It's I was just talking so to somebody good. about that last night. Oh my god, best actresses ever, and I just girl girl, girl powered. The actresses are phenomenal. All right, yeah. I'm gonna start it. Text or phone call. Text. Bills or sabers. Bills. Hiking or skiing. Hiking. Last question: Chicken wings, drumstick or flat? Drums. Good call. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. Bell Ringer is a podcast by Invest Buffalo Niagara, the region's privately funded, nonprofit marketing and economic development organization. Please rate this podcast, follow our social media channels, and read our blog at buffaloniagara.org for the best of Buffalo Niagara. Come grow your business with us.